from our usual Sunday morning uh, schedule. At this hour, we usually have our Bible classes, but it was decided that for today, uh, we would have uh, preaching instead based on the, the overall theme that we have. Brother Connor is going to be doing why should I follow Jesus? We're going to examine why should I not follow Jesus? Uh, so we have uh, about 10 points that we're going to uh, get to very shortly. But uh, next week we will resume with our usual uh, situation with the classes and we'll resume out here our study of how we got the Bible and looking at various texts. But for today, let's go ahead and read the scripture reading, Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21. Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21. <clears throat> Do not lay up treasures on earth for yourselves where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys nor where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. As we mentioned, uh, next hour is going to be devoted to why I should be a follower of Jesus. But this hour, we want to discuss why a person should not follow Jesus. And we'd like to begin with number one, why I should not follow Jesus if all I desire to uh, if we should not, if all I desire is to obtain some sort of worldly gain. And uh, you can see that in the way certain people over time have behaved. For example, suppose a businessman comes to a small town, and many of the townspeople are Christians. In fact, the vast majority of them are. He doesn't particularly care one way or the other, uh, but he attends and uh, he's a member of the congregation, but only not to follow Jesus, but to develop a better clientele for himself. Well, where is his treasure? His treasure is on earth, not in heaven. And you might think, oh, well, that... Uh, that certainly wouldn't happen. No one would be that crass, but it has happened a number of years ago. Uh, I won't mention but uh, what the product was, but uh, a couple came to me and said, have you ever thought about selling this particular product? And I said, well, no. And they said, you need to come to one of our rallies and, and find out what it's all about, and and because uh, we could use somebody who's a minister to sell the product. Well, I didn't particularly like that thought to begin with. But I went to the rally and uh, Barb and I talked it over and we decided I had enough things to do. <laughs> so that wasn't going to be included. Well, they, we had studied with them and baptized both of them. And as soon as we turned them down, they left like that. Uh, yes, they were looking for a way to advance themselves financially. And uh, it was a sad situation that somebody would think that way. Uh, I had called to talk to him one day afterward and got his wife, and we had a brief conversation. Apparently, it had upset her. He called me back and said, don't ever call my house again. If you do, I'm going to go over your head. I, <laughs> I thought, well, go ahead. <laughs> I think he must have had some kind of a denominational concept or something. But his uh, attitude of smiles and uh, 
acceptance and all of that suddenly turn bitter. So I know that people do that kind of thing. And they're not really interested in heaven. They're interested in things that are available on earth. That's why Jesus said, perhaps in Matthew 13, 22, that uh, there are some who are like the soil that grows up with weeds and it chokes the good plants, the word. It chokes the word. Materialism will do that to people. So as Jesus said about those types of individuals, truly they have their reward. He was talking about other things, but it would apply in this particular case. He has his reward. He has the only reward he's ever going to receive, which is of an earthly nature, and that is not going to be worth much in the near future. The second thing that we'd like to look at this morning as to why I should not follow Jesus, I should not follow him if I am insincere. <clears throat> Some people in the, it's recorded in the Bible, tried to make a name for themselves. Let's turn to Acts chapter 19 and look at verses 13 through 16. Acts chapter 19 and beginning with verse 13. <clears throat> then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, We exorcise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. And also there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish uh, chief priest, who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. It doesn't pay to try to pretend you're somebody that you're not. Maybe they wanted uh, an, their own following. Maybe they wanted their own glory. And so they thought they could be sneaky and use the authority of Christ, but they did not have the authority of Christ to try to do what they were doing. They were perhaps, uh, as far as we know, not even followers of Jesus. There's no indication that they were following Jesus, just trying to use his name. Now, an actual follower of Jesus was Simon the sorcerer, but he had this problem also, and we read about it in Acts chapter 8, verses 18 through 23. So let's turn back there and read that. <clears throat> Acts chapter 8, verses 18 through 23. <clears throat> and when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Well, of course, that did not go over so well. Peter said to him, Your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this your wickedness, and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you, for I see that you are uh, poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. And uh, the text goes on to tell us that he did repent of those things. 
But no one should become a Christian with the idea of gaining power or control over other people. No one should pretend to be a Christian for whatever motive he might have in doing so. Sincerity is essential. Number three, I should not follow Jesus if my heart is not in it. Some are satisfied to just go with the flow. If they lived in a Muslim country, they wouldn't care. They would be Muslims. They just go by what's popular. They just do what everybody else is doing. This is not a matter of sincerity or conviction. Let's turn to Luke chapter 20, uh, 14, verses 26 and 27. Luke 14, 26 and 27. Because Jesus had something very specific to say about this point. He says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Jesus must be first, ahead of every relative that you have. But more than that, he needs to even be ahead of you. We can't say, I'm first and the Lord is second. He has to come first in all things. And Jesus goes on to talk about counting the cost counting the cost of being his disciple. This is what it's going to require. If you're not willing to sincerely give your heart, then don't follow him. It won't work out in the long run. Before becoming a Christian, someone, everyone, should count the cost. Being a Christian is not a casual proposition. It's not a casual matter. It requires thought and willingness to follow him thoroughly and completely. Number four, I should not follow Jesus if I am prone to be motivated by pride. Let's take a look at John chapter 7. Verses 45, let's make it, through 49. Now, they, some of the rulers of the Jews decided they were going to try and send some soldiers to trap Jesus and bring him back as a prisoner. But when they came back, they came back empty, and they were questioned about it. Why? And the officers answered... Verse 46, no man ever spoke like this man. Now watch the response. Then the Pharisees answered them, are you also deceived? Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed on him? But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. I think they may have had a little problem with pride. Oh yeah, we know better. We know better than everyone else. They assumed that their lofty spiritual positions made them know more than someone without any academic credentials. After all, who is this Jesus? Where did he go to school? Who did he study under? And the people that are listening to him, what do they know? That was their attitude. No wonder the very first Beatitude says, blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Everyone must approach God with humility. These people would never be humble. They would never humble themselves. And so they could not be part of the kingdom of God. 
And one must, be hum uh, must humble himself enough to acknowledge his sins and to repent of them. One must also admit that in his life he may have been taught wrong. He may have been taught error, maybe by well-meaning people, but still taught error. And he must acknowledge the need to change what's wrong and practice what's right. So if you're prone to be motivated by pride, you're not going to make a very good follower of Jesus. Number five is I should not try to follow Jesus if I don't intend to give up sin in my life. A person must be ready to let go of sin. Now, we could look at numerous passages that deal with this. Romans chapter 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, Colossians chapter 3. But let's just read one passage because that will give us the idea. Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I told you before, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. What good will the pleasures of sin do in eternity? And so they must be given up if I am to follow Jesus. Number six, I should not try to follow Jesus if I really love this present world more than salvation and the future that Christianity has to offer. One of the saddest verses in the New Testament is 2 Timothy 4 and verse 10. Demas, having loved this present world, has departed. He left the work. He had been working with Paul, but he decided that he loved this present world more. You might think, well, hypothetically, how is that possible? This world doesn't have anything to offer compared to what heaven has. But people decide to go with this world, don't they? Instead of heaven. Some are content with what they can see around them and what they can gain in this world rather than to look ahead. And what is it that this world has to offer? Ultimately, ultimately what this world has to offer is the grave. That's all it has. Oh, you, you can accumulate stuff while you're here, but this is your ultimate end. Well, somebody made up uh, or improved on a slogan. You know, you've seen the one that he who dies with the most toys wins. Someone else uh, came along and said, he who dies with the most toys is still dead. And that's true. That's what this world has to offer. That's the ultimate end of everything that you might do and accumulate. The grave is the end. However... The scriptures, the New Testament in particular, offers eternal life. And that is far better. So which one has the, has the best offer? People uh, look for jobs and they look at all the offers they have. Well, in the days when you could get a lot of offers. Uh, and you'd look them over and say, well, I, I believe this is the best offer. 
Or maybe somebody looks at insurance policies and says, which is the best insurance policy to have? Well, I'll take the one with the best offer. Well, here, here are the offers, the grave versus eternal life. Now, which one seems best? But let's go to number seven. I should not try to follow Jesus if truth is not important to me. We talked about that last uh, Sunday. And uh, if truth is not important to you, then you probably are not going to obey the gospel. But if by some chance you did, you're still not out of the woods. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 14. Paul talks about those, uh, the fact that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Some will listen to what somebody says and say, oh, that sounds great. Listen to what somebody else says, oh, that sounds great. And neither one of them may be in harmony with the scriptures, but they're only going by what they hear and they have no roots, they have no stamina, so they just bend whichever way the breeze blows, like a palm tree. No, you cannot follow Jesus if that's the way that you approach truth. You cannot be susceptible to every false doctrine that comes along and be a faithful Christian at the same time. Number eight, I should not follow Jesus if I am willing to be influenced by others more than by Jesus. Now, many people do things because of positive peer pressure. And there is something good to say about positive peer pressure where we are all Christians, we're all encouraging one another to do right, to grow, to develop, uh, to be the best servant that we can be for Christ. That's all good. But sometimes positive peer pressure might lead someone to be baptized at camp because everybody else is being baptized at camp. That's not the right reason. That's not the right reason. So peer pressure can be good, but every person must be persuaded in his own mind of what is right and not do it just because others are, just to go along with everyone else. No one should obey the gospel because somebody else expects you to do it or uh, because of some other, maybe several other people expect it. It should be done because you believe the Bible and want to obey God. That's the reason. But having said that, on the other hand, don't refuse to obey the gospel because somebody won't like it, because someone will become unhappy if you do, or maybe disinherit you uh, from either the family or the family fortune. You should do what is right because you know it is right, regardless of what anyone else thinks. Don't be like those that uh, we talked about last week from John chapter 12, verses 42 and 43. Those were not honorable people. John chapter 12, verses 42 and 43. And you remember this, I'm sure. Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. I cannot obey the gospel if I'm going to be influenced by others and end up retracting 
my salvation or living to satisfy other people. I must do what is right because it is right. Number nine, don't try to follow Jesus. I should not try to follow Jesus because it seems like the safest thing to do. You've known people like this. These are the kinds of people that end up like those in Athens, don't they? Who had an altar to the unknown God because they didn't want to offend any God. And so if they left one out, they had an altar to that one. So they couldn't offend him. I've read uh, of some who are trying to be Christians and Muslims at the same time. So they don't offend either one. But the very idea is offensive. Christianity teaches that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and the Muslim religion teaches he is not. Now, you can't reconcile those two ideas. They will not uh, work. So you cannot try to please everybody. Because sooner or later, if you try to figure a way out to placate everyone, have you thought about the fact you're going to have to try to placate atheists too? How's that going to work? What will you do when becoming a Christian is no longer safe? Matthew 10. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. This has happened to others. The prophets that were before you. But you're going to have your faith tried, and how are you going to stand up then? You're going to realize you cannot placate everyone. You cannot satisfy everyone. You have to satisfy God. That's where we need to be. And number 10, I should not follow Jesus if I don't love God. You know what the greatest commandment is. Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 and 38. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. This is the first and great commandment. If I don't love God in this way, what good is it going to do me to try to follow Jesus? There were many religious folks in Jesus' day but he told them the truth about themselves in John chapter 5 and verse 42. Now remember, these were some of the most religious people around. And yet Jesus said to them clearly in Matthew uh, chapter 5 and verse 42, But I know you that you do not have the love of God in you. Can you imagine being told that? But Jesus told the truth. And they did not have the love of God in them. Don't try to follow Jesus if you, have, if you don't have the love of God within you. Loving and appreciating God is fundamental. We are only responding to his love. But God commends his love towards us, Romans 5.8, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And 1 John 4, 19, we love because he first loved us. Well, here are the ten reasons again for not uh, following Jesus. Not if all I desire is to obtain some sort of worldly goal or gain. If I am insincere... If my heart is not in it, if I am motivated by pride, I should not try to follow Jesus if I don't intend to give up sin. If I really love this present world more than salvation and a heavenly future. Number seven, if truth is not important to me, don't try and follow Jesus because he offers truth. If I am willing to be influenced by others more than by Jesus, or just because it seems like the safe thing 
to do. If I don't love God, these are all reasons not to follow Jesus. But let me mention briefly what are some correct reasons to follow after Christ. Number one, because of the evidence. Mark chapter 6, verses 54 through 56. In the first century, Jesus went about healing all manner of diseases, casting out evil spirits. Whether he went to towns or cities or just little villages, people came out to him and as many as touched him were made whole. Why should anybody listen to what Jesus said? Because he had the power of God that he demonstrated. Why do you think people in the first century followed Jesus? It wasn't just because of what it said. That was another factor we'll get to in a minute. But it was because of the evidence that he offered to prove that he is the Son of God. And uh, the apostles had the same thing. Mark 16, 20 says, uh, They went everywhere preaching the word, the Lord confirming the word. The word was confirmed. It had already been preached by Jesus and attested to, but people needed to know that the apostles were carrying on the same message and had the same authenticity, the same authority that Jesus did. And so their word was confirmed also. Thomas was overwhelmed by the evidence of the resurrection. Remember the first time Jesus appeared to the disciples, Thomas wasn't there. And he said, despite the evidence of his uh, fellow apostles, he said, I, I just can't believe it unless I see it for myself and touch his wounds. So Jesus appeared to Thomas and he said, here, you're getting what you want. Go ahead, touch the prints in my uh, hands. Uh, thrust your hand into the hole in my side where the spear was cast and blood and water came forth. Go ahead, Thomas, and believe. Well, the text doesn't say Thomas did either one of those things, but he did say, my Lord and my God. The evidence convinced him of his resurrection. Number two, because of the quality of Jesus' teachings. Remember, we talked about those soldiers that were sent out and they came back and they said, never man spoke like this. They realized that there was in his teachings that which no one had ever presented before on earth. And they probably recognized it was the truth as well. And uh, that's when they got excoriated by those who sent them. But they recognized what the truth was. Number three, because of the fulfilled prophecies Let's take a look at Acts chapter 2, beginning with verse 25. Because this is what Peter did on the day of Pentecost to change what might have been a very hostile crowd into one that accepted the gospel where 3,000 were baptized that same day. But what convinced them? Now let's begin with Acts 2, 25, where Peter quotes... From David, for David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is my, at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh will also rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made it known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. And then having quoted the passage, Peter added these words. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb 
is here with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. The people knew the prophecy. Peter reminded them of it, but they knew that prophecy. And they knew what he was saying as he applied it. The, uh, this, this has been fulfilled. Now, this is only one prophecy that has been fulfilled. There were uh, at least 50 specific prophecies concerning Jesus besides this one. And they were all fulfilled in Christ. This was not an accident. We have the place of his birth. We have the fact that the soldiers would gamble for his clothes while he was on the cross. We have the prophecy that he would uh, be um, amongst the wicked in his death. And he was. He was crucified between two threes, uh, thieves. But he also was uh, said to make his grave with the rich. And a rich man did allow Jesus to use his tomb. It had never been used before. But we could go on with a number of prophecies concerning Jesus, and they were all fulfilled. So you consider the evidence, the miracles, the quality of his teachings. You consider the fulfilled prophecy, and then you can say, as Peter did in the very next verse, verse 32, they could say it, we can't, this Jesus God has raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. We, didn't, we weren't there. We didn't see him, but they did. Now, in the law of Moses, it is said that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Here are 11 witnesses, 12, because now they had replaced Judas. Here are 12 witnesses that saw Jesus resurrected from the dead. Not two or three, 12. And so in addition to all the other reasons to believe in Christ, we have the testimony of reliable witnesses. These are reasons to believe in Christ and to follow him, but not the ten reasons we gave earlier. May we consider those matters and make sure that we are following Jesus for the right reasons, and because of the evidence, the proof, the quality of the teachings, the eyewitnesses to his resurrection, may we follow for those reasons rather than some earthly reason that is not going to gain us anything. At this time, we'll have a few minutes break, and then uh, we'll start our worship at 10 o'clock.